Who is Peter Wolf? Or Peter Randall as he was born? Or was it Bill, which his family and his oldest friends still call him today? That's the thing with Peter. He is and always was surrounded by mystery, intrigue and rumour. But who is Peter Wolf? What's true and what's false? Over the past few months, I've spoken with Peter, his family, friends, acquaintances and some enemies. In fact, people Peter thought were his friends actually turned out to be his biggest enemies. Well, enemies may be a strong word, but they were certainly not the friends that Peter thought they were. You see how confusing Peter's story is? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Anyone that knows Peter personally, even slightly, knows that he very rarely gives interviews and has almost never given a televised interview. He's possibly at his most uncomfortable when doing so, but through many, many hours of recorded telephone conversations that have taken place in many different places at many different times, both Peter and I have attempted to piece together the real story. So please join us on Peter's journey from the darkness. Though my mum was not a junkie, she was a gentle and kind person, and my dad did not drink special brew. I think it's obvious that those lines are about myself. I was born in East Rawlin in a little house in 1968. My mum was a shop worker, my dad was a carpenter. Two sisters, uh, Deborah and Kate. I'm not a gypsy, um, I'm Church of England. There was a drama, um, I did find out exactly what happened. It's a home birth complications incubator for three months. They said, can you name him quickly in case, in case something went wrong? And my mother wanted to call me Bill. My father said, no, call him Peter because I'm strong. When I came out of the hospital, my mother had contracted TB and she was in hospital for a year after that. I was at home in East Morning, looked after by neighbours and yeah, everyone rallied round. And uh, when mum came out of hospital, she never really came home. So I didn't have contact with her until much later. Other than my mum not being there normal, I was happy. I liked football. Yeah, a good childhood. My first records were George Benson, Gilly the Night, Michael Jackson, Off the Wall, Stevie Wonder. People are often confused by Peter's taste in music as it's very eclectic. He loves Jim Morrison and Marvin Gaye, but perhaps the biggest influence on Peter during his childhood was George Michael, and it was after seeing him in concert that he made the decision that this is what he actually wanted to do. Another aspect of Peter's life that he sees as no big deal was the fact that he played football and was a phenomenal striker who played for both Maidstone and Gillingham Football Club, and he once scored 14 goals in a single game. This made the local papers and his mum very proud. Perhaps the most significant meeting during Peter's childhood was that of his lifelong friend, Julian Taylor. Yeah, Julian has been a really good friend throughout my life, and still is. I met Julian at, at school. Um, he was in, we were in the same uh, form, 1P. He was good at music. He was the only, him and the shoes that they formed then. In the first two years at Comprehensive, they formed, and they were the only musicians in the year. They were all pretty good, uh, so to, so to them, the rest of us were mere peasants. And uh, yeah, I lost contact with him until I left school, really. 
after two years, he went to the grammar and I stayed on the comprehensive. And then I got in something very really perfect and I gave him a call. I was like, Joe, can I come in here? He's like, yeah. My first band was something very really perfect. He was a mate from school. They'd lost their singer and uh, I met them and I joined. We practiced in the local church hall and Neil had written a couple of songs. So I decided to write one and it was called Heading for Dream Town. It's really an innocent um, sort of dream of what, what might happen in life. Um, a smile where I'm thinking back at it. Awful singing. The sentiment was there. I always like um, uh, people are not scared by Pownie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's got this proper vibe and now, man. <laughs> People are not scared. People are not scared. People are not scared, and they do not run. Because people are not scared People are not scared I wanted to move out when I was 16 and uh, my dad's sister came to live so I had to move out. I moved in with my mum which was really nice for about three months and then I moved to London. I moved with Julian and his band, The Shoes, we moved to Willesden, Dollis Hill, and uh, we lived there for two or three years. Scarlet gigs with them, I became their roadie. Uh, it was the, one of the best times of my life, and they were real good. I used to go around playing pubs all around Kent and in London. Then they got a huge record deal back in the day when it was still a big transfer signing or something. But not everything in London was wonderful, and after a brief fling with a young woman, one particular problem followed him all the way from Kent. <laughs> Just to skim over the details of this case, Peter had enjoyed the company of a young woman that turned out to be the girlfriend of a bouncer come underworld figure that was quite well known in the area that Peter was from. This person naturally took offence to his girlfriend's infidelity and immediately issued threats to Peter, which Peter naively brushed off. This wasn't until one night that he turned out of Peter's place, and after Peter leaned out the window to tell him where to go, he saw the guy pull out a shotgun and the flame shoot out of both barrels. The blast shattered the window and blew up what seemed like a whole room at the time. Peter would often make light of this incident in interviews with throwaway answers and humour, but after speaking with Peter, it's quite evident that this is very much part of Peter's coping mechanism to diffuse highly emotional and difficult, embarrassing situations. When you look deeper into this, it becomes clear that it was a very dangerous and serious situation that affected Peter far more than he ever let on. Well, it was a situation that got out of hand, and uh, a nightclub bounced uh 
he fired a, a, a sawn off shotgun at me and the police chased him. They couldn't catch him. Thing went on for a while. They eventually caught him and ended up at the old Bailey and he got charged with attempt to endanger life a firearm and I I tried to brush it off but my friends at the time said that this is going to affect you Pete but I was young and I didn't know too much about how things worked at the time and yeah sure it affected me later on I turned it into a, a good effect because I explored the emotions of what happened through my songwriting nevertheless Peter joined his first London group that were known as La Luna after the Duran Duran song Peter joined as their vocalist but didn't like the name at all and purely for testicle reasons, Peter having one shaped like a lemon and the other a torpedo, the name was soon changed to the Lemon Torpedo. The members were Pete Randall, Tim McTyre, Rob Borgall and Justin Welch. Yep, the drummer from Elastica. I put an ad in the Melody Maker, I think, for a band. They answered the ad, we met up, they were three cracking lads from Leicester. We had a real laugh together, we hit it off and they got on with Julian's band as well and... We started rehearsing every night after work. Everyone had a daytime job. I was working in Liberties and got our demo together, did all the gigs on the circuit, and yeah, it was real fun. Um, we had 13 million miles, which was a, we came together as a band with, which I'd recorded earlier at, in, in Highgate, I think, I remember the studio. <laughs> song I wrote with them was Auntie Sophie oh no near to earth then Auntie Sophie it's about an ex-girlfriend of mine but I portrayed her a bit cruelly she was a bit older than me <laughs> heavily uh and get involved in Camden scene and meet other musicians and sort of came apart like that and I met some guys that I thought were more suited to the direction I was going in a bit darker Justin, Justin went to Elastica Tim disappeared and Rob went to his girlfriend in Leicester I think and carried on another group yeah met them in Devonshire or through the Devonshire Arms in Camden Town, right in the middle, and they, the rehearsal studio was in their basement, just around the corner. We got together, and it was they were all Scottish lads, and yeah, it came together quite quick. 
After the Lemon Torpedo folded, Pete became the vocalist and songwriter for the Sex Gods. The members were Peter, Alan McCulloch, Terry McClay, Rick Payne and Steve Reed. There was also a past member by the name of Shug. Pete was at the very heart of the music scene of the day and was friends with many up-and-coming singers and songwriters, including the likes of Brett Anderson. And there was a consistent rumour of Peter living with Shane McGowan, and this is also rumoured to be where Peter started using heroin. I did not live with Shane. We hung out together at his flat on Black Sock Road. It was a year I saw on the double, I think, or they certainly won the title. I remember leaning out the window. I'd, I'd say nights there and I kept Shane company and went on some concert dates with him and yeah we had the same my girlfriend was at the time was close friend with Shane's wife and it was a it was a good time um I wasn't it, drugs weren't harming me at the time I didn't have a habit it was recreational stuff and it was all quite it was all in a, sort of innocent and we went to a lot of clubs and parties and played gigs and it was yeah all going in the right direction i had the deal in sight. The Sex Gods went on to produce the cassette single with three tracks on, She's in Drag, Open Sky and Genius. Metallic Emotions is also a song that the Sex Gods wrote and performed, but sadly Peter has none of these recordings in his possession. He does however have a two inch multi-track tape that he hopes to one day get transferred to digital media. It's very frustrating for Peter that there is a wealth of his work out there with known individuals, but for various reasons they refuse to return or share it. The Sex Gods were a phenomenal live band, and their gigs were legendary. The power and the intensity of these live shows was really something to behold, and something I can attest to having first-hand experience of. It's getting quite raucous, and there's a lot of drugs and drinking involved, and partying, and it was a time of that, uh, a lot of ecstasy going around as well. I dabbled at this time, um, a couple of times, but no habit. I stopped, it was, it was scary. It, it was when I was 21, it was just there, and someone else tried a bit, I thought, oh, I'll try some. I was, uh, I was in a relationship and uh, drinking a lot and taking a lot of drugs, and it all sort of imploded at once, and I suddenly had nowhere to live, no girlfriend. All I did was drink and take drugs and I'd lost contact with my friends. It was the gig at the Marquee. It was supposed to work and it didn't. It just didn't work. I was disillusioned at not having a position, a situation in the, in the, in the music industry when it had taken off the most people around me. Uh, I was depressed and couldn't stand it where, where I was and had to leave. It was roughly 1993 that things got very frustrating for Peter to watch everyone around him finally break through and attain that elusive record deal. Judy and his best friend had just broken through with his then band Star Club. Shane McGowan was starting to gain traction to his already blossoming career and he even saw Brett Anderson one day and was told by him that he was to appear on the cover of the NME. Peter at the time just shrugged it off, but there he was, as bold as brass, the very next week. Looking back at this period, it's certainly the time that Peter was starting to descend into addiction. He was drinking far too much and after he broke up with his girlfriend he sank into a deep depression and decided to get away from London and clear his head. I got down to Brighton uh, I spent a couple of nights on the beach and then I visited my sister who lives in Worthing and uh, she knew a chap that had a house with a room and I moved in there. I just locked myself in with case after case of wine and I was writing. I was an alcoholic at that time. I was an alcoholic 
This was an extremely bleak time for him, and possibly Peter's lowest point was when he found himself homeless with just his journal. His alcoholism had really taken hold, and he had some pretty desperate times. At that time, you got 25 quid for unemployment benefit, which you had to sign on for, and that was it. Um, it was never enough. I was always scamming wine or people, or just getting by my wits, and, but I had this dream of being a poet. As Peter often does, he massively underplays this period of his life, but the harsh truth is that he had no money for food and was living day to day, sometimes with only brand sauce on toast to sustain him. But there is a survival instinct that was and is strong in Peter, and he slowly regained his confidence. In his eyes, he was reborn, or at the very least reinvented as a writer. In Brian, I changed my name to Wolf, because I liked the character of the animal, and I couldn't stand being who I was. I think I was, I was really depressed, not helping myself drinking. And I went to write, and I thought, OK, I'm going to be a poet. I failed at music. And I made it to calling, I reckon. I started writing and became more confident. And uh, from one of my visits to London, I met a girl that was a student in Glasgow. And uh, I bought the bus up to Glasgow with my little plastic bag and went to stay with her. And that was a, a productive time writing. Wise. We had a tenement flat on Paisley Road West in Glasgow, right near the football ground. I don't know her exact title. Her family were Polish, Polish aristocracy and very cultured in the arts. Her mother was a student at the Royal College of Art and influential on my writing and my career. She sort of had what I needed, which was sort of this educated, cultured, that she knocked off my rough edges and I gave her an edge, which is really like a, a Bonnie and Clyde. It was a good match. And also, we drank together. Uh, yeah, that, again, I, that, that was the intense relationship I had for, I don't know, five or six, maybe seven years out of control from day one, really. We were both bad with each other. Wolf would often sneak into lectures at a university where he would spend the day educating himself on an array of subjects, whilst all the while keeping close to his newfound love. It, it wasn't so much education, but when I drove that into the college grounds in the morning, I'd sneak in then with her to the lectures because I'd never been in such grand buildings with all these people learning. I'd just been on building sites and gigs, football pitches. After his girlfriend left university, they returned to London, where Wolf was soon indulging again in his nomadic lifestyle, often from sofa to sofa, always one day away from complete homelessness. This coupled with his overindulgent alcohol and drug consumption was starting to cause serious problems in Wolf's life. Lots of people around Wolf at this time feared for both his health and his safety. He was also at this time deep in perhaps the most toxic relationship of his life. But quite amazingly, this was to be an extremely fruitful time creatively for Wolf. It was 1994 that Wolf was introduced to Andy Lee via a mutual friend called Jeremy. Well, we were staying with a chap called Jeremy Wall in, in Brixton and I think he'd been to university with this chap Andy Lee, and yeah, you know, I met him there. He went on to make this film about me while I was drunk, and uh, he was mentally ill at the time, and sort of we had a battle of wits, which I won. Romano and I moved into Jacane Court as we were homeless. We just smashed up Jeremy's flat. Jeremy arranged it. Soon after Wolf moved into Jacane Court, Andy started suffering mental issues. It's not exactly clear whether this was because of his MS that was undiagnosed at the time or whether it was just too many recreational drugs. But either way, Andy thought that the spirit of John Lennon had entered his body and was now controlling his thoughts. Therefore, Andy was sectioned to the Priory under the Mental Health Act for 28 days. On his return from the Priory, he asked either Wolf or his girlfriend to move out of the property, and it was then decided that they would go to New York. Ramon and I managed to get a trip to New York together between us, a sort of make the make the... Pan and you know, off I went first on my own to get a flat, again, an apartment. Yeah, that's, that's what we call serendipitous. I I, I just picked a, a, a note off of a wall. I, I went to I went to the New York University to look at on the pinball for flat shares, nothing. I wandered back, just saw, I don't know why, I picked off this note from a from an outside a shop and, and rang that number. It was a girl called Jess and a bloke called Marty. They were really nice, man, really funny. And they grabbed my monies. We had a laugh and 
yeah, I moved in. Uh, later found out they wanted that money. They'd obviously gone straight out and scored. And so I was drinking. They were using. And then Romana moved over. And uh, then they moved out. So I had the flat to myself for quite a while. And it was great. Wolf and his girlfriend continued to live in the USA on and off for the next two years, returning pretty much every three months to London. It's quite clear when looking at Wolf's life that he lives extreme highs as well as extreme lows, and this period really is an extreme high, especially in the fact that so much happened in such a short space of time. Wolf gets recognised and befriended by the artist Gilbert and George from a review in the Evening Standard. They're quite smitten with Wolf, and they invite him to their home. I bumped into them in Brit Road at Cultural Virus, and they took an interest in me. And we had breakfast uh, soon after that. And then they visited me in Paris. And I went to their salon and they showered me with gifts and also name checked me in their interview that week. And the, the, I think it's the standard. The, the journalist asked them who they thought the, the new star was going to be. And they said, Oh, Peter Wolf, the cocky poet. Also during this time, Wolf's writing is really taking off, and he compiles a book of poetry, and he calls it Pornographica. I went to a party one night in Bishop's Avenue, which is that place in North London, and it was a sex fetish party, and it was quite an event. And I had a Gautier costume, and they led me through to the sun room. And from there, I explored the party, and it, had, it was quite an event. I went with an Indian girl called Rama, and I'd never really been to such a thing. And when I came back, I, I wrote down this description of what it was to me in a sort of verse, and it took off. And from there, I showed some poems and song lyrics to a publisher, and he leapt on it, moved me into a fly in Hampstead, took me to Paris. Uh, well, I published Pornographic Cut. It's strange to hear, but for Wolf, even after publishing this book and for all the poetry that he has written, and there are a great many examples, he still sees himself rather as a lyricist than a poet. There were swords and whips of varied design. There was alcohol, second old, poppers and wine. There were wimps and pimps and studs in the dungeon and remas. In the torture garden, these scenes... When Maki decided and were making me sweat, I went dizzy there hard and so enjoyed a schoolgirl I found on a coked up luxury lollipop round. There she was done, and so were my parts, with vicars, high women, teachers and tarts, until I came on a gothic girl, refusing to wipe my holy swirl. Pornographic cut. Pornographic cut. And she took off her panties and held them aloft and thrust them under my nose for a waft. They stank like a swamp, but I was elated. But then from behind near the penetrated, I sprang around to punish the culprit who down on his knees was begging to go bit. I said I was ready, but really not keen to have my lollipop licked by a queen. Pornographic cut. Pornographic cut. As I gazed upon this rampant flock that now were into ultra shock, I fancied the bar from a piece of mind, but they were at it on there from front and behind. So now, to the moral of my tale, which is there isn't, we're all up for sale. This is for those that love a jolly old romp with circumstance and plenty of palm. Pornographic color. Pornographic color. During their time back and forth to the UK, Wolf becomes part of a group called Metro. They did record some demos, but this group was very brief and comes to an end abruptly after Wolf abuses them all one night during a drunk blackout. I put an ad in again, you know, or it was or it was word of mouth from someone I knew that there were a group of lads from somewhere like Basildon, through young lad, where they'd been in the sort of Brit pop or uh, yeah, Brit pop indie bands before. But they were pretty good at their instruments and I marshaled them. We rehearsed for, I don't know, a couple of weeks. And I got them into my mate Tim's studio and we made a demo. And then I phoned them up one night and abused them all. And they said, we're leaving. And it was all over and done within a month. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the fates not on you. 
classic line. They are some of Romana's words. You can probably tell it's such sort of star of splendor carried not it's some, not something I would write. But she insisted she was you know, she she'd make it impossible for me to go to the studio. She'd beat me up when I got home, whatever. She was saying I was stealing all of her years, all this fucking palaver all the time. It was Romana but just to keep her quiet. I cried I did a bit of a Johnny Rotten on it, I think, at the end. <laughs> yeah. So I called it sick right. Pop art, yeah, it, as the title says, it's my take on, on pop art. Pop art lyrics, they don't really mean anything, they're pop art lyrics. That was the first recording. I recorded it with instruments, called it pop art. There's a little bit of sort of philosophy and stuff in that, is playing with words. Um, but I liked the uh, arrangement, and that arrangement eventually became, um, my mother was a chunking at that time, special group. Listen or listen hard and close while you morose, which became Wolfman. I originally wrote that singing along to pop art. Included in the publishing deal for Pornographica comes a very nice flat in Hampstead Heath and this aids Wolf's permanent return to London and he sets about turning the poems of Pornographica or as Wolf states the lyrics into songs and his first recorded work undertaken is with his friend Julian who around this time was nursing his own feelings due to the sudden breakdown of his band. Julian from a very young age had a recording studio in his home. He started with the usual tape recorders then progressed to a 4 track and later an 8 track recorder which is no mean feat for those days as analogue recorders and studio equipment were neither cheap nor easy to come by. The relatively easy and cheap recording that home PCs offer us today was totally inconceivable back then and it's what makes it so difficult to document Wolf's early work as the actual process of recording was almost impossible unless you actually had the money to pay for studio time. During these first sessions, they recorded two songs, Reasons to Stay and Chaser. It's, yeah, it's about feelings I, I was having for my then, my girlfriend at that time. Uh, it's, a, it's a straight up romantic love song and it's jazzy. <laughs> See you, I find myself in a familiar place Temperature's cold in me Ruins of our years, cast alone in mysterious clay At the memory's altar Let's try it once again Take a ride on a dragon sunset there Fall in love in a brand new way Say the things we always wanted to say Many reasons to stay Many reasons to stay I say it's about drinking, um, stretching my legs, um, trying to combine poetry and, and lyrics together. And there are a couple of good lines in it. Uh, ultimately, it's a mood song about drinking, nothing specific. Morrison, it turns, I think. Um, it was the first track I began recording with Jude, and it was a fourth back recording. I was careful to get my point across. I wanted to impose on Jude how I wanted to go on. I think I wrote Chaser in mind to record it with Julian. I wrote it on the guitar.
his friend Julian, Wolf now becomes part of a band called Shoshone that consists of Wolf, Simon Walker and Tim McTyre. The band's name was Simon's idea and was taken from an Indian tribe. Wolf's writing is on top form and he records a wealth of music daily with Tim McTyre over at his house in Bounds Green and a very many demos were produced over the two years that they were together. But Wolf's friendship with Tim has soured and sadly Tim refused to have anything to do with this project and also refused to share any music he had done with Wolf around this time or later. In fact, he went as far as to say that he destroyed all the recordings. Wolf, however, does still have two of these tracks. a battle of wills between two people in love so desperately in love that they rip each other to, to pieces but the message of pure love throughout it and the similar message in a lot of my songs but the core of his alien gods on cyanide that that would refer to me and ramona being alien to each other on poisonous alcohol being the living daylights out of each other in every way possible it was toxic Princess India is about time when I was um, living in Kilburn and drinking on Kilburn High Road a lot with real toxic people. Um, and uh, Romano went off with some rich dude to Persia for about three months on this luxury trip and just left me in the chip. <laughs> Had a stab of delivery 
Indian gods and princess India would both eventually develop with the help of Julian's a well-known song called Siberian Fur. This was born from an amalgamation of waltz lyrics from both alien gods and princess India and a bass line of Julian's inspired by the ending of Ghost Town by the specials. Julian produced the backing track and the song was recorded by an all-girl band both Julian and Wolf were writing for at that time called the VIPs. titles that were written for this band are Heavenly Bodies and Naked Again. Wolf and Julian continued to write songs for themselves too and this is when Taking the Booty is first recorded. Both Wolf and Julian are becoming very close writing partners and it's very evident that both are a real powerhouse when composing together. It's now 1998 and one day Wolf turns up at Julian's house in Highgate with a new song he's written about his relationship. The song is virtually fully written and Julian remembers he only had to add a few things to it and change a couple of chords. The main thing that was written by Julian for this was the piano hook that you hear right from the start. This marks the beginning of what would be known as the For Lovers Sessions. Lots of great tracks emanated from these sessions and around this time. For Lovers, Music's Hypnotising and Role Model. It's also from these sessions that From the Darkness, Bohemian Trinket, Darksome Sea and Withdrawn and Shaken are recorded for the first time. Both Julian and Peter find it important to note that whilst these songs exist out there on the internet, these are actually all demos and not the finished article, which can be very frustrating when compared to finished productions, the most common being for lovers. certainly very busy around this time and although a lot of positive creative work is flowing there was also some very negative behavior too if you look at it back then or i was drinking too much taking too much getting involved in too much i had to have there was fucking dramas every night around my gaff one night we woke up we'd all the place was smashed to bits cleaned out all the fucking lags the front doors off the hinges the old build i started dabbling during the, all of this time but i od for the first time in 98 i decided to use crack i was hanging out in um Bayswater and labrador grove with a real bohemian crowd sitting in a circle smoking crack and smoking heroin once or twice a week if you can hear the references in the music it's coming clear it started off at that phase with reasons to stay and i was i wasn't using and after i think after a year and all the respect of that book publishing and what went on in paris i i tried i tried using yeah it was really heavy um toxic with romana in our goldhurst terrace flat she'd gone with gone off with another fella we were both smoking crack and 
dabbling. I ended up sitting on Primrose Hill one uh, early one morning, about four in the morning, with a bottle of whiskey, drank that, did whatever I had with me, and just fell asleep. I was woken up by someone, and well, not woke up. I woke up in hospital, and a doctor had found me, and they'd taken me in and looked after me, and that got Chinese whispered to suicide. Although this wouldn't be released until 2001, it was in fact 1998 that Peter starts to film The Greatest Unknown Rock and Roll Star with Andy Lee. When this film is screened on Channel 4, it consequently shows off a strange mix of Wolf in various states of intoxication. When you watch this documentary, you notice that what started off as a profile of Peter Wolf slowly loses its way, and even before it's halfway through, it seems to become a story about Andy's personal friendship with John Lennon's confidant, and you find that the concentration shifts from Peter to Andy's hero Lennon. Some of the footage used does not place Peter in the best light and comes across as just haphazard material that has been scattered in amongst what is now a totally self-immersive project that seems to only serve Andy's personal needs. I spoke with Andy Lee and asked him what the film was supposed to represent in his own words. There was a, a, a series on Channel 4. Uh, it was called Ideal World. It was a late night, very, very low budget, you know, first time or, or, or yeah, first time directors for a TV documentary and um i knew about it because the producer i knew was 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 running it and and um i just said well we should do a film about you i said if we make if we if also it's the idea was that if we make that connection between him and being famous and make him like the, the greatest unknown rock and roll star then it'll come true so you have to be careful what you wish for but um he literally became the greatest unknown rock and roll star he managed to even get nominated for an Ivor Novello Award for his first ever released record and still not make it. Still, I mean, he didn't win, but there's only three people nominated in that category. But no, no, it was that we set it in stone with that film. It would remain unknown. If this is to be agreed with, it could be considered, I suppose, as ironic. But in my personal opinion, and in that of those close to Wolf at the time, it is actually the very first time we actually catch a glimpse of Andy's narcissism, because this is quite clearly the self-indulgent Andy doing what he does best which is portraying Wolf's creative work in such a way that actually just serves Andy's own needs. And sadly, the only irony in this barely 30 minutes of film is that it was made by perhaps the world's greatest unknown filmmaker, who continues to be pretty much unknown to anyone outside of anything that's not attached to Wolf's work. Wolf was not only confused, but far from happy about this documentary, and it's relieved once it's aired and over with. Wolf's later fans were totally unaware of this film until it was uploaded by Andy Lee to YouTube. And almost as soon as it was, Wolf asked for it to be removed. And eventually Andy agreed and withdrew it totally from the public. That was not the intention that he gave to me that would be the reason for this film. It was supposed to help me get into the music business. Of course, I, I could see that it wasn't. And, and I asked him for years to take it down. Hated it. And I don't use that word lightly. The way I was portrayed, um, I didn't like any of the shots. There's only a couple of shots. He took one good photo, which can be enough, but relationship, whatever it was, progressed. Sort of, he wanted to get involved, but it was about him, not me, so I didn't want to. I was the star of my movie, he can go and be the star of his. I, I, he, he was, he'd just come out of the Priory, he thought he was John Lennon, for fuck's sake. Fucking hell. It's a painful period of time for me, I was low, and as I said, as it went on, he, he, he began to not play the game with me, so it became clear what he was about to me. During all this time, Wolf continues to record with Julian and they experiment with different genres for the VIPs. Face the 
music Faced up, life's a bitch, life in a line Self-denial, I came to the rock of a new lifestyle Shipwrecked and the sea is red I'm bleeding from my veins in As explained, they still record for themselves and experiment there too with a more up-to-date dance sound. gig as a two-piece, and there is footage of this shown in Andy Lee's film, but for all the good that is happening, Wolf continues to struggle with his relationship and his demons. This was the period where, um, after that happened, I, I had to leave London again. I was, I was so, I was so down on my luck. I had to, I think I had about on same with my father. It was dreadful. Um, and during that time, Romana had got to for a flat on Amwell Street in Islington with Carol. They did, they just got back from New York. I was supposed to go to New York that day. I was supposed to go to New York, but we fell out the night before we were playing and uh, it was a really bad letdown for me and came away for a couple of months. When she got back, she moved into this flat in Amwell Street and I moved into it with her and Carol. <laughs> It was around 2001 that Wolf and his girlfriend were living almost bang opposite Filthy McNasty's. Wolf came home one day and was introduced by his girlfriend to a tall thin guy called Peter Doherty, the words at the pub. Peter Doherty turned up at my flat. Um, he was serving in the bar across the road. Uh, yeah, I just met him there and he was still about all the time. He was everywhere all the time, running around. In Wolf's words, through an interview with The Guardian, he said Peter was just there when I got home one day and kind of never left. There was a genuine friendship. Wolf stated that Peter was the first person to look at him and not think cunt. And Peter said that Wolf was the only person that looked after him as there was lots of chaos in his life at that time and that Wolf had saved him when he was drowning and kept him afloat. Due to both their addictions, their relationship could be described very much as a twisted brotherly love, even a very platonic but very chemically induced romance. And from pretty early on, they both drifted into the lives of two hopelessly addicted and disheveled poets. Though contrary to what Doherty says in his biography in later years, Wolf immediately became some sort of muse to Doherty. In fact, there are quite a few confusing quotes that were included in Peter's later biography. Romana said to me, oh, but he, he's going he's gonna to crack it, he's going to get on this. I was like, sure, but, you know, 
okay, whatever. And uh, it wasn't a case of how he explained it. I became his best friend after he got a record deal. They weren't called the Libertines back then. And we just, you know, having fun, recreation, dabbling drugs around and, and drinking the pub. It was all a little community there. You know, obviously, I was to have a. I was a bit older than him, ten years. I'd done a lot of music before and been around a bit, and had this sort of edge. And um, I'd, I'd lend him that, and or you know, we can help each other out. And uh, yeah, an artistic thing as well. Um, I'd give him books to read. He'd read all my lyrics, listen to our music. I didn't listen to his music. Yeah, it was. Um, I was. I was a bit taken aback when I saw what he'd written in your book. Yeah, he had, he, he, it was obvious to everyone around that Pete had adopted my persona and was heavily influenced by my songwriting and poetry and image. Yeah, I'd be like out of bore. I gave him that book to read, explained it was at the edge. We gave him excellent book to read, which I'd been given by Romana's mother, you know, a hero of our time, them on top. Stuff like this is good for a young man. He took this information and fed it to his people, and they all thought he was a genius. Docky is held solely responsible for enabling Wolf now as Wolfman, a title Wolf was never comfortable with. He was known locally as Pete Nice, Peter, Wolf, or just plain Wolfie, and he felt the Wolfman moniker was cliche and far too common and confusing. I don't know, people used to call me Wolfie or you know, Pete. I remember being in New York, I think I met Wolfman Jack met him so and he thought I was like I'm not Wolfman it's Wolfman that I just didn't like the sound of it I, li- I like walls but not the horror at all whatever it is although it's been reported that they were writing companions this is not strictly true Doc Ian much preferred to use lines from poems and songs already written by Wolf mixed in with his own lyrics Wolf's lyrics are all over the Libertines recordings of that time Delaney Road to Ruin The Man Who Would Be King Skag and Bone Man to name just a few and at times, Doc, he would use whole songs that he would make very minor adjustments to, such as adding a verse or changing a word or two. Doc, he would then record them for the Libertines, Baby Shambles and later his solo albums, and often wouldn't give any or the correct credit to Wolf, and certainly not a fair share of the publishing. No, he never gave me fair publishing, and it was always a battle. And then people would say, oh, he doesn't have anything about it. Yes, it was obvious. If we delve deeper into this, it soon becomes clear that there's also another victim to this kind of behaviour, and that was Julian Taylor who quite clearly co-wrote songs with Wolf that Docky goes on to claim that he had written. The most significant being Broken Love Song, which Julian wrote with Wolf, but he's not even credited on the record when recorded by Docky some ten years later. Docky states in his biography that he wrote Broken Love Song when he was living under the Westway, but remember the VIPs? It's very clear that Docky didn't write that song but only added to an already existing song and what's more troubling is that Julian isn't credited at all. This is a pattern that would repeat itself over and over again and was something Docky was not immune from doing to other artists such as Mark Heads and Alan Watts to name just two. I think I might have heard it on the radio somewhere but I always find it painful because it's never rewarded me in the way you know it's always a, a, a bad reminder for me of how I've lost out. He justified it by saying he wanted to change the line so it could make it personal for him right so i would agree with that but and it took away from the song uh but then to later go on and claim credit for writing it is a joke he also states in peter's book that wolf was the first person to inject docky with heroin i wasn't injecting heroin when i met peter injecting came later with grave consequences as, as well that became another thing people people blame me for his drug habit Again, another another joke. What is true is that both Wolf and Peter were already regular heroin users. Yeah, I was using heroin at that time. The deep, the deeper I got into it, the uh, further the connections were, the more available it became. More, it's a different game to most drugs. Uh, it began to work for me. It it hit up a part of my character that I despised, and it began to work for me. People thought I was cool or I don't know. It, 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 yeah, heroin. It, it began. It began to work for me. It, I, I pursued a way to to make sure that I could take that every day. It, oh, it, it, and it lessened my drinking, which physically made me healthier. That was a big factor. 
a big factor. At the time, people encouraged it because my drinking had gotten life-threatening and very self-destructive and pathetic. Uh, heroin took away the... Um, I was able to not drink with heroin or certainly have control of drinking with heroin. I, I was heavily reliant on heroin and alcohol and crack and there was a business in the offing he was going to have a record deal and do well and did i want to come along and was i going to get on it and i thought right now's the time to clean up so off i went and this is to uh i'd been introduced to this chap colin is a cousin of andy lee's californian uh counselor drug counselor and uh yeah that's who i went out to meet and it was successful and that would that was a big relief colin and i I think we've been to Vegas, we were driving back, stopped off to see his friends. Uh, he he was friends with Jackie Mason. Jackie Mason was there with a young woman, beautiful. He, we had a, a, I had a coffee and he had a drink and we had a chat and we hit it off. And through him and his friend, they um, got me the Sundance uh, booking. Wolf returns to the UK and he sets about getting the band together. And this is where Julian and some other friends he knew from the psychedelic group, the Egg, come into it. And they immediately start rehearsing for the festival. So initially, the side effects were Julian Taylor, Matt White and brothers Ned and Matt Scott. Both Julian and Peter had been playing live shows as a two-piece for a while now. And have a set which includes Taking the Booty, For Lovers, Role Model, which would later become Napoleon, From the Darkness and Siberian Fur. Wolf finally has a band of his own to work with. And by 2002, he also gains a manager. Hofmeister Bearstrap, replete with hat, teenage forger and a limp rhetorical posh format, doormat, aging and fat. <laughs> uh, he started dating Carol. Romano and I hatched a plot because there was whisperings he wanted to be a manager and get involved with Pete, that he could maybe be my manager and I instigated it, got him on board. And then what happened, happened. I, he was obsessed with Pete from the start. Uh, most of the talk was about him. He was an unhappy man, an online gambler. Uh, he had a bookshop. He fancied himself a bit of a man about town. And I th yeah, I, I, I don't know what went on between him and Pete privately. He's not a music man. He, he's a, a gay lord. You know, like, that's being kind to him. It's fair to say that Jake was very beneficial to begin with. He had time and money to invest into promoting Wolf and his work, and he did spend a considerable amount of money both producing and recording Wolf and his music. Jake was definitely in awe of the whole scene around Wolf and Docky at the time, and he was solely responsible for finding an extremely gifted singer called Frankie Farrow, who used to be the backing singer for Wolf's hero Marvin Gaye. As soon as Wolf met Frankie and heard him sing, he told Jake that he wanted him in the band. Docky had been booted out of the Libertines due to the lifestyle he was living around that time, and it was fair to say that it was pretty much Jake's idea to have Docky recalled for lovers, to show a more general side to his persona that was being discussed by fans at the time on internet forums. So it was in 2002, nearly two years before its release, that they recorded this song with Wolf's band The Side Effects. This started out as a project that would hopefully make Docky a household name and ignite Wolf's career and get him his much desired record deal. This kind of tumbled into a bit of a farce. Not for the obvious reasons of drug binges and chaotic recording, though there was plenty of that, but because everyone suddenly wanted a share of the pie. This song, as explained earlier, was entirely written by Wolf, and the music was certainly written by, and at the very least enhanced and added to by Julian, so there we have the two main credits. Docky had just come out of prison for burgling Holborass flat, and as he was to be singing the song as a featured artist, it was deemed a good idea for him to reference this by adding the lines about the jailer. This now gives Docky writing credits. From the very start, it was clear that both Julian and Jake didn't really get on, and it seemed Jake would often go out of his way to sideline both Julian and Wolf. He also began to recall parts without Julian being present, the most significant being the middle eight. Jake felt as a producer that the song needed some kind of middle eight, and in his own words when asked about this, he said that he hummed Ned the keyboard player an idea for him to play on sim strings. Jake saw this as beyond producing, and claimed a writing credit for himself. Amazingly enough, Wolf also thought it pertinent to give the band a credit, as there was no money as stuff to pay the band for their time recording this song, and so this now added Matthew Wyatt and brothers Matt and Ned Scott to the list. If this wasn't already enough, Jake thought it was a good idea to add his friend David Banks, who was also in the studio at the time, so he also got a credit too. 
So this now totals eight songwriters. In my opinion, the only thing more astonishing than so many credits just being given away on this song is the Frankie Ferro was left out for delivering his beautiful, ghostly backing vocals that were mixed in Fjord's words at almost a subliminal level. Therefore, all of this lays to rest the popular myth of Wolf selling his credits in a pub to Jake Fjord for just £700 as just another complete fabrication. The song for lovers, when finished, is immediately prevented from being released by both the Libertines manager and Rough Trade, and frustratingly Wolf's recording contract is again just out of reach. Wolf and the side effects keep on with their life set and soon they find themselves at the Sundance Festival in 2003 and they deliver an amazing set. This includes the newly titled version of Role Model, now known as Napoleon, Siberian Fur, From the Darkness, and they finish this set with a superb live performance of For Lovers. There is footage of this concert in Andy Lee's possession, but he's never released any of it. Jake was said to have slipped the sound engineer $40 to record the show to disc, and this is where the bootleg recording of this show emanates from though to this day Jake claims the copyright and refuses to release the full audio. The bootleg version that has been doing the rounds for years was leaked to the internet and was taken direct from the copies of the band's personal recordings given to them at the time, though most of Napoleon is missing. Hello Sundowns! We come a long way to see you guys. We can be there, divided evermore. Where our emotions are caught, create a state of war. But we can shine in the line, we can travel on. Shape suns, I'm right, mystery, I'm gone. I wanna be your boyfriend, be with you to the very end. Without you, I am passionless. They all return to the UK somewhat triumphant and a real interest starts to grow around Wolf and the side effects. Docker is kicked out of the Libertines for a second time in 2004, and this is when Rough Trade finally agrees to release for lovers, and it is an instant smash hurling to number 7 in the UK charts, and both Wolf and Julian are nominated for an Ivor Novello Award, although this has to include all songwriters that are credited. There is a single launch at the Virgin Megastore, and a launch party hosted later that evening at Café de Paris, and Peter continues to join Wolf and the side effects at various shows to perform this track. The Lover stays in the charts and Wolf is now blatantly sidelined by everyone involved. He's constantly incorrectly referred to as Pete Doherty featuring Wolfman and is even introduced as such on Top of the Pops where Peter performs this song along with Wolf's band to side effects. It's just gone 7.30, it's Friday night and you're tuned in to Top of the Pops. Our next performance, well, it's a real special one for fans of the Libertines. Please welcome to the stage the might of Peter Doherty featuring Wolfman. This is for lovers. <laughs> Again, there are various rumours as to why Wolf didn't appear, but the truth is that it was simply manufactured from the beginning to have nothing to do with Wolf, and contrary to popular belief, this pains Wolf still to this day. You know, like Pete is in that book and he, he said, oh, Wolf would love not being on Top of the Pops. No, I fucking didn't. I, I remember watching Top of the Pops with all my friends in a flat, and yeah, it hurt like fuck, and it would be a classic setting that it, I'm, I'm laughing at it and just coating it off, and but inside I'm, my heart's breaking. When those feelings came up, I just drowned them and fucking annihilated them with heroin. I'm the only one that deserves a novello for that on the philosophy of what an Ivan novello is. They nominated everyone else because I gave them a percentage of the royalties because I wanted the band to continue and they were moaning about money and I just thought it was going to be a big hit and everyone would be rich. Biggest mistake of my life. Christ. But everyone knew that I wrote the song and uh, yeah, of course I'm the mug. I, 
trying to explain that. I had that strange beliefs, man. I was heavily relying on gear and it's the truth. I, I had all sorts of beliefs, which I now know are, are insane. So it, it saddens me. Saddens me. There is even a promotional video made for this song, and again, Wolf is totally excluded from even a slight cameo appearance. Looking back from that day, Jake's eyes were fixed firmly on Doherty, and both Wolf and Julian were purposely sidelined. I always had this feeling of being, you know, back of house or behind the scenes, and uh, at that time I had the girls and some money and a nice place to live, and as much drugs and drink and a bit of travel and gigs as I wanted, so I wasn't going to moan. I enjoy. I did it. There were, like he said in his book, this is one thing I did sort of enjoy the notoriety at times, but it was only because I'd earned it. He he hasn't. <laughs> You know, it was it was all going in the right direction. I thought you can achieve, get into the business, and you know, um, get yourself some money and, and get off drugs and get yourself a life and have work and have a purpose. Am I wrong for that? And of course, of course, it goes along with poetic sensibilities. You think, oh man, I just got to live a good life and do this. You know, it's hard. You can't just strive for to be loved by people or money. Jake can't recognise what. He doesn't know. Jake is in no way, shape, or form a musician or writer of any sort. And he did not recognize that first I was a musician. And most of the people at that time didn't. Doc E appears on MTV's Gonzo and recites the poem that Wolf had written from an adaptation of an early song called Pop Art. The original was to be called Godzilla, but this evolves as a very tongue-in-cheek version of his newly given media persona and finally presents himself finished as Wolfman. He recited it on television once, and he didn't even say this is by Wolf or nothing. He just came out of there and let people think it was him. Listen hard and close, why are you morose? Did you take an overdose to the winner's post? Can you make the chase? Internet, database, web page, you're out of your face. I'm in and out of space, Wolfman. It's given me the hump, man. You come in like a swamp man, but I jump when you say jump man. The spit's on you, so what you gonna do? You got a junkie for a mother, your dad drank special brew. From the estate you had enough on your plate, there was a gang in the shadows. I made the getaway, wolf man. It's giving me the hump man. It's coming like a swamp man. But I jump when you say jump man. Jump, 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 jump. Get into the vibe, slamming a mega drive, arcade fire denied. I pulled my sent him to kingdom come. Alley cat, got your tongue, skid saw his fame on the run. He's wanted by the sun, wolf man. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> the lyrics to this song have been taken literally over the years, but in reality, it isn't at all autobiographical. Wolf, as well as recording, starts to appear with Doherty in his newly formed band Baby Shambles and Wolfman becomes a crowd favourite. It's recorded by Doc E for the debut album Down in Albion, but it's dropped at the last minute in favour of Pentonville, which according to archaic rumour was due to a deal he made for protection from the general while serving their prison sentence together, though it should be noted that it was used as the B-side to the single Albion. It should also be noted that again Doherty claims a wiring credit for a song that was already written years before by Wolf, though there was a slight change to the song in the verse of Giving Me the Hump Man, which was actually added by Cole Barat. There was now a very well publicised out of control descent into what seemed like an endless, chaotic, drug and drink addicted existence for Wolf at the time, and this made it very hard to record any new material to back up the success of others. All the while, Wolf is being villainised, not only by the papers, but also within his own camp, and now they seem to be actively keeping Wolf and Julian away from pretty much any time in the studio. Uh, yeah, and the poem was uh, a song that was released as a follow up to For Lovers, which was a crazy decision on my part. I was using heavily and drinking very heavily at the time. I wrote those notes in New York in 1995, just off of Houston Street in my apartment, sitting there one afternoon with Marty. Um, just started it off a scenario of me walking through New York, and it went on from there. 
So it's, it's, it is autobiographical. I've had, but it was unlike anything anyone's released, I think. And, uh, yeah, it was too far out there. I was again, really unhappy with the recording. It was cursed with bad luck, both live and in the studio. Um, yeah, odd. No, I don't like to say odd. Um, yeah, it was, uh, as I say, um, it has its, it has its pros and cons. I'm, I'm proud of it as a work of lyrics, but I'd like to rework that song. I'd like to record, oh, I'd like to record it again. A, a blend of role model and Napoleon. Here comes a lower inside I come In a futuristic war zone Yeah, I'm in the role of Napoleon I got a bad blood Got food and holes in them Yeah, I'm making up a free mythology To a Marvin Gaye anthology I look around the shout at the wind I got the vow of ambition Get from within The sparking stars to the master Napoleon was rushed out and I feel very badly mixed with false vocals almost buried. This was back with a Jack Fuel remix version of From the Darkness for the B-side, which neither Wolf nor Julian are happy with. What's more, Fuel seems to have sampled Julian's parts and mixed them with a very substandard performance from what little of the side effects they included for a recording of this song. When released it reached number 44 in the charts. I am criminal, I am insane sensations Intrinsical to spectral, almost hate burns And time is a grain for the sound magician Love is a hand, touches the rhythm The rhythm vibrates, and all is forgiven Alas, the road to ruin is the road I've chosen All unholy, all I ever believed in Voices are of evil, love awakening From the darkness to the sun Docky is also now beginning to turn on his friend. I was at a pretty dope point to trip uh, on my ass, smoking a lot of crack. I needed anyone on board who could fill my pipe and drink. It was a pretty low time for me. My arrogance outweighed my now, so I just thought I can handle this. I was an arrogant. I know it wasn't arrogance. I don't know, man. It, I just didn't. I, I lost control of it, and I was like, I had a habit. I mean, that day when it all like Pete was riding high and they were obviously pressuring him to come up with songs. So I went off with Julia and came back that night with Ducks and Sea, Bohemian Trinket and um, with Drawn and Shaken. And it, it, it just, it was rude and horrible and going to sulk and went out. Fucking left me with no money. Fucking, I'm like, what? I'm sitting in the dark, sick. Not been out recording every day for our project or whatever it is. So new songs were being made available by Wolf and Julian, and they were also being played live. They include Dark Some Sea, Bohemian Trinket, Broken Love Song, and a song called Ice Cream Gorilla, originally titled Motherfucker, but changed last minute due to fewer panicking. Even though in a rather awkward earlier interview, he seems unable to hide his excitement that Wolf was recording a song with the word motherfucker in it, and he draws attention to the fact that he don't care if he gets banned. This is again another example of how the people around Wolf seem to think it's beneficial to put him over as some kind of dark pop villain in a very crude attempt to stir up some sort of Sid Vicious type persona that in reality isn't really there at all. The title is thought to be named after the super strong cannabis Gorilla Ice Cream, but is in fact referencing the ice cream vans in Scotland that delivered heroin during the infamous days of the ice cream wars. This was to be the final single released by Wolfman and the side effects. The song Wolfman is recorded with Pete Doherty for the B-side, and again, Fuel seems to have buried Wolf's vocals.
By this time, Wolf's lifestyle was too much for Julian, and after a fracas with Jake Fiore at the Ivan Novello Awards, he left the side effects and then London altogether. This kind of also marks the end of Jake's time as Wolf's manager. Jake does, however, stick quite obsessively close to Doherty during the next 18 months, trying at every opportunity to get him to recall various Wolf songs, Broken Love Song and Dalston Sea, the two that spring to mind. I progressed pretty quickly with my heroin habit. It became more all engrossed. I, I couldn't function. Well, yeah, I'd get a couple of hours of the day where I'd sit down with my guitar <clears throat> or my journal, um, but most of the time I was concerned with my movement and my availability of heroin and alcohol. And I didn't have a lump of money in to steady myself or, or you know, get it together. I, I was on the edge all the time. It's like being on the edge of a cliff all the time. Like at night, you end up over the other side of town and someone said, how am I going to get back from it? But, you know, outlaw, proper outlaw. I was in the music business. People were saying, you know, don't worry you. Yeah, of course it does. Fine. I couldn't face my feelings at the time. I just saw an end means to an end to get to get myself some stability where I could look after myself and get a place to live. And then they really stepped up stamping on me. And then when they finished with me, they kicked me out. And then it was all over and I was fucked. <laughs> in, a, in a nutshell, as he would say. perhaps the best video ever of Peter Wolf for his single release of Ice Cream Gorilla and as things turn sour between Fiora and Wolf he steps in briefly for a time as Wolf's manager which in both their opinions was just madness. I asked Andy what his thoughts were of Jake Fiora and whether he feels Wolf was mismanaged at the time. Oh god I don't know really I mean he um he was as fucked up as everyone else he seemed full of well cash at some point he seemed to have a lot of cash and then also seemed to be worrying about cash a lot. So he was uh, flashing it as if he was... So he was trying to play the game. And he thought, right, if we're going to do this. We're going to make out that we are the biggest fucking thing. And he probably believed it as well. And, you know, 
that's what he did. But it was all, I think, a lot of front and not a lot of backup. Has he ever been fairly represented? Um, what does that mean, really? I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's... I mean, you know, had had Jake been dealing with somebody who was clean and sober and Jake was clean and sober, then they could have done great things together. That wasn't what was happening. There's a lot of people chasing dreams, chasing um, states of mind that are not as horrible as whatever it is they're normally... So they're drinking and they're taking drugs of one sort or another. And within that, the way you can make that work is to turn it, turn the whole environment into a thing you sell, you know, records or whatever, you know, and you could either make the drugs part of it or hide it or whatever, but there's lots of people seeing it as an opportunity to remain kind of young and free and let go and take drugs and have fun and make money. But there's, you know, it doesn't always work. Often you don't end up making money, but, but there's this moment where everybody thinks they're in this, rock and roll dream where 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 we're off to america and whatever's happening um but it's not really it's not the foundation is very flimsy because there's so much fucked up behavior going on and childhood trauma being expressed that no one is really going to ultimately take them seriously it's now 2006 and wolf records an updated version of princess india with the rapper grams and producing is his old friend tim mctire from lemon torpedo and shoshone but things sadly go very wrong that was the day i looked back out and it had it had consequences and and i regret how how out of it i was i was really looking forward to it because tim had agreed to come up with a the backing track for the new princess india and it would but it would be produced at i can't remember, even remember the name of the studios but it was in the west end and it was through uh the record company i can't even remember which one when tim arrived and put on the, the backing track my heart sank he'd taken the original bass line out and it was nothing like the original and i think from then on i think i might have even had a tantrum and then i lost it and it turned dark and and grams was there with his mates and they were being really professional and his performance was so solid it was just brilliant i didn't live up to his uh style i, f- I think um because t- I, w- I, had, I had the ump with the backing track and i changed all the lyrics did it on the spot rearranged the, the song to the way I felt and a, the chorus, it's nothing like the original so yeah, it all went wrong and it didn't work As soon as he put that backing track on, I, I was like, what have you done? It had gone wrong by then, but I was I was in chaos with the drugs. I should have checked before, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. It was purely musical. Yeah, he was a, a, a delicate guy to work with, but me and him were pretty pretty tight, man. We'd spent such a lot of time together, you know. I used to, I used to just sleep over with him in those early days at his place, and we'd get up and... He was he was good with recording machines and all that. He was good at production. I never saw him again or spoke to him. He, I don't think he could believe the scenario of of drugs, booze, and the company. It, it, it scared him a bit. But he was a talented producer, and he had a, he had a. I, I worked well with him. Like I say, the two tracks, two of my favourite tracks, right up there: uh, Princess India and. Alien Gods, the backing track from them are uh, closest to our picture of the song, and you know Tim was responsible for that. A studio has been with our stuff, but Tim was was different. Wolf was in quite a bad way, and he decided they should clean up with Andy's cousin Colin. And again, this is very successful. <laughs> Thank you. 
was some kind of film being made around this time by Andy called Wolfman and I, and perhaps the most bizarre footage is that of Andy's cousin Colin Swift singing and dancing on the beach with added footage of Wolf being treated in rehab. This takes on a rather more disturbing meaning once you realise that Colin is actually Wolf's therapist. The I did speak to Colin regarding this video and he said that it was just a fun way to explain the things needed to recover from addictions and that he asked Andy to make this into a fun video of him singing this song or mantra. I think it's fair to point out that he had no say in what content Andy used. I asked Andy why he felt the need to include Wolf in this video and if he felt that as his manager at the time it would undermine him as an artist in any way. That was a joke. It was real but you know it was for fun. Yeah I did that one. I was, um... <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with it. He's just making a fun of himself. That's Colin. He, he, but, but um, you know, the, the message is clear. I was shooting a film about Wolf that I've been making for years. He was out there and I went out to visit my cousin. I can't even remember what, how I got out there, whether I went out specifically or whether I was filming something else and went and visited. I don't, don't remember. But, but um, yeah, I filmed all sorts of stuff of, of him doing yoga classes, you know, at the gym and all sorts of swimming and all that stuff. And I, And then... Colin wanted to had recorded this song with a friend of his and he wanted to make a music video. I said, okay, let's do it. And I just went and did it with him. It was, that was what it was. I mean, he was really there with Colin. That is really what Colin's like. And, um, and, uh, the, all of the footage is of him getting him shit, getting his shit together. You know, the, the thing is that you could say that the whole cool thing about being cool is, um, yeah, the whole idea of being cool and being, um, you know, just cool and, and professional or professionally cool or whatever. That's what gets them into all this pro problem in the first place. <laughs> but, but a recovery is just, is not actually that cool, is it? It's, and, and, um, I wasn't thinking that when I was doing it, but I was just making a funny thing for Colin, but, I, but I don't, I mean, it's, it's out there, but it's just, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I had never thought that about it really at all. I, I mean, I know it's ridiculous and funny and everything, but it's also, you know, everything Colin says in that song, however sort of mad it is, is, is very reasonable and exactly what you need to do in order to, um, you know, move on, let go of all this stuff. It wasn't a part of managing it. Definitely not. Sadly, this sobriety was to be very short lived as immediately on Walsh returns to the UK, he is met by the same old crowd and he slips straight back into the same old behavior. Andy arranges some stage gigs for Wolf and the side effects, all of which were played without Julian and were pretty poor due to the condition Wolf would often turn up in, and one of their final gigs was at the Scala on May the 7th, 2007. If you float your boat, I'm gonna sink you. I want to hit for you, me and drink it. If you float your boat, I'm gonna sink you. Oh, we try. What is it for you when we gone to hell and back again? Don't you fuck with me, millions of make believe. Highways of my ignorance, for the sake of fantasy, liars in the gangstery.
Now, when watching footage of Wolf filmed and released by Andy Lee from this era, 2006-2008, it is certainly a bizarre time, and there is some equally bizarre footage of Wolf, often in varying degrees of intoxication, where he seems uncomfortable. There is footage of Wolf joining Doherty on stage for his Royal Albert Hall gig in 2008, which was received less than favourably by the press, and considering it wasn't the worst performance that Wolf had turned in in those days, it perhaps goes some way as to highlighting the media attention that now faces Wolf, who right from the start really took the blame for Doherty's drug and alcohol addiction. There's some endearing footage of Peter helping Andy's daughter Edie play the guitar, and these close moments with Andy's family are held dear within Wolf's heart. He was, after all, Uncle Pete to Andy's children. This is sadly tinged with footage of Edie performing duets with Peter whilst he is very intoxicated, and it comes across as a bit opportunistic. Not by Edie, as she is a young girl that is obviously smitten with the chance to play live on stage, and she has some genuine fondness for Uncle Pete. Though this comes across as opportunistic via Andy, and gives this time a real uneasy feel to it. been told since by various people that Andy was planning for Edie to release some of Wolf's songs, and there is footage of Edie singing these songs without Wolf present at all. In 2009, Wolf takes on a strange cameo role in the film Rock and Roll Fucking Lovely, along with both Pete Doherty and Mick Whitnall, but nothing much else is documented. Two thousand and ten is perhaps the most heartbreaking and devastating period for Wolf, as this is the year that Robin Whitehead sadly passes away due to an accidental overdose at Wolf's flat. Robin and I were friends, and uh, what happened to her is it's a tragedy. Robin and heiress to the Goldsmith family had been filming a documentary about Peter Doherty, which also incorporates others around at that time, most notably Wolf and Alan Wass. She was a lovely, sweet girl that it seems drew the attention of everyone around her. There are many stories of jealousy and obsession, most notably from Doherty and Fjord. This is such a sensitive subject, 
and the stories differ wildly depending on who you speak to. I was just as confused about this period during my research into Alan Watts, as again, there were just so many discrepancies between different people's different turn of events. The main points that don't seem to differ are that Robin was sadly a drug user too. It's common knowledge that Robin had already grown accustomed to using Valium quite regularly, and had now started to use somewhat harder drugs recreationally, and even that her using was definitely starting to intensify around this time. So much so that the people around her, definitely her subjects, could see that her film was very much being sidelined. She had after all built up very close friendships with them all. Robin's sad death definitely marked the total end of any producing, managing or even friendship between Wolf and Fjord, with Fjord publicly blaming Doherty, Wolf and Alan Wass for Robin's death. He gave a very scathing interview at the time, and seems from that day on he saw fit to discredit Wolf from pretty much everything he had ever done. Jake also deletes for lovers from as many social platforms as he can, including iTunes, etc. I was there, I, I know what happened. I told the police and I told her family. My harrowing youth did not contribute to Robin's death. Wolf, Pete Doherty and Alan Wass are all arrested in connection with Robin's death and drug-related charges. And after many weeks and court appearances, on May the 20th, 2011, both Peter Doherty and Wolf were jailed. Doherty for six months for possession of a Class A drug, and Wolf for 12 months for possession and supplying a Class A drug to Robin by way of passing her a makeshift pipe that was used to smoke crack. Alan Wass was later given a three-year conditional discharge and ordered to pay a hefty fine for possession of the same Class A drug. Doherty stated in his book that at the time of sentencing, Wolf was in a bad way and that he was led down the steps looking quite bewildered by the whole situation, and he states that he was the one that had to tell Wolf what had happened. Pete's report of the court day, uh, I took offence at what he said about me in his book of that day, and it's incorrect. I was aware and I was in charge of my senses. I, I was just really sad and near broken by what was happening. Um, Pete seemed really uncomfortable, and I like, wasn't well, a time to grieve for me. I just needed to get through the day time leading up to it was really upsetting and being heavily dependent on the drugs and alcohol at the time and i was nearly incapable of moving and had to be picked up in the morning and helped but i did it as best i could and gone with the day it was a difficult day when we got there he he was uh soon whisked off into a uh, solitary and I went in with the lads. I got through it okay, you know. Um, I, I surprised myself. I think it brought out the the fighter and character in me, and uh, I got on, I got on okay. Didn't have tr any trouble, and you know I was I was in there for over eight months in twenty three hour lock up, and he left after I think two weeks. Went to an open prison, released after three. I later had my chance to face her family in at the inquest when I was in prison, which I did, and uh, that was emotional for me. I, I just did what I could to get through it, you know, and I've since had contact with them and we go on, but I, I said what happened to Robin is a tragedy. I still grieve. I often think about Robin. What is quite clear is that all of this had taken its toll, and once in prison, Wolf finally had time to face the tragedy that occurred and finally began to grieve. Wolf had no choice but to clean up in prison, and so embraced this with regular workouts in the gym and writing both poetry and in his daily journal. Wolf served just over half his sentence and was released in September 2011. This was not a good period for Wolf, and after being met at the prison gates on his release by Pete Doherty, he descends very quickly back into the life of addiction. Leaving prison, it wasn't good. It didn't go well. I should have gone somewhere and say, you know, he was waiting outside the prison. I don't know where he was, but I uh, didn't go well. He had a little place on Camden High Street. But it was a sort of communal place. I, I bunked up there for a, a couple of months, but I knew I had to leave. It wasn't a lot of help. I was direct on a program out of prison. I had to report to a, a drug officer out of prison. Uh, and they were, they were monitor, monitoring the scripts. Um, but of course, of course, that's about drinking. That was the beginning of a bad time. I, I, I was tumbling after everything that had happened and uh, I didn't really want much to do with anything and it, it was a pretty bleak time. Yeah, a lot of hospital, you know, a lot of accidents, all alcohol and drug related. 
an incident and within that half world of trying to give up and still dependent and living the life and coping and and all the hurt from the, having no money from what for everything that I've been to well wow, that really hurt I hit the hit the ground with the clump I was homeless in 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 and sofa surfing for all that time in and around London I ended up in Ealing in a in a real state and 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 a awful awful place fuck oh Jesus no money and no one and no one answered the phone <clears throat> So yeah, I hit the ground with a clump. There was, it was uh, no, no one picked up the phone anymore. It's, it's one of those. Also around this time, Wolf appears in a video with Patrick Balfe singing a song with Wolf called The Morning Needs You. This was not written by Patrick and is in fact a cover of a song Until the Morning, recorded quite some years before, as explained earlier by Julian Taylor. Though it is true that Patrick is responsible for the music production on this track. remember in Camden town I'd come out of prison it's early after that and I was there with a few mates and I was singing Until the Morning which is a song written by Julian where I was in trouble in hospital um, after ODing and there's a guy called Pat Patrick he was there and he joined in and, and shot a video and I think in the you know intoxication at the moment he didn't or I didn't make him understand that it's a song I'd written he, he thought he made up at on the moment um pat pat was a really sweet guy um well, um very up and down but very young and pretty good musician by all accounts i never actually saw him play i related to him because you know he was just a little troubled so i related to him you know when he was unwell you know i was trying to find him with natalie and we Wished him the best, and I, and I still do and always will. Wolf lives this way for nigh on three years, and is pretty much ostracised by everyone within the industry. This sadly includes his ex-manager and friend, Andy Lee. Much to many people's astonishment, Wolf survives perhaps the most desperate time of his life, and finds the courage again to focus on getting clean. And he once again turns to his therapist, friend, and pretty much last hope, Colin Swift. Step back from the brink, open your mind. When the days begin with the rolling papers, then you wait for that second nature to kick in and awake you. Out of that tortured state of behavior that God gave you. But that ain't no easy change to make, so I don't blame you. If you just sit with the thoughts, Change your behavior, it's major.
from the brink yeah i wrote it in california um it's a bit dark for me because i couldn't see, i don't think i could see it i went 50 50 on that with julian uh, so i think the backing crack is all his i don't really have a tune for it i'm just i think i'm speaking to myself it's some sort of therapy sort of talk um so any people that know me or get what i'm talking about in that when Robin happened, it was right out of the blue, and it knocked me. I don't like talking about myself with Robin, you know, the family I care about. And really, I, that's when it was over, and it's, it's been a, a clean-up ever since. But it's been 10 long, hard years of cleaning up after 30, 35 years of using alcoholism, severe alcoholism, solid, and about 20 years heroin crack. It was a struggle to get there, and at times I thought I never would, but I did. And really, at times, I thought I never would, and and often I don't often give up. But I can never go back. When you when you're young, do you know what I mean? It eased the pain of for me not being. I should have been in the fucking studio or doing an interview or languishing with some tart, some fucking on a yacht or something, right? But now I'm in fucking Crystal Park, fucking shivering, just waiting to meet someone, thinking, what am I fucking doing here? Then you win the game. Uh, you win, and what is once you you get trying to get out of the game that it's hard. Yeah, when you're trying to get out of it, it was a dark time. I needed to escape, and Colin is there in the California sun with a pool, and I was in a half decent shape. I wanted to go and do some writing, but get away. From, I was living badly. You know, my situation was made more sense to be there. So I flew to Colin. While I was there, I got a message from Natalie, and I flew to the other side of the country to meet her and yeah that was it it wasn't anything to do with drugs or drink she said if you and i get together there's no drugs or drink if you do i'm off and i knew in my heart i know in my heart it's the only way for me it's the right way and she was the right girl not only for that for a thousand other reasons uh but that was her first thing so she got me it got my best interests at heart peter was trying to get help again and it, not exactly a rehab, but his friend Colin. So he was in America, and um, he found me. He started talking to me online, <laughs> and then and then he asked me to come to Los Angeles, and I said no because I I was all the way on the East Coast, and then he had to have Colin call me because he was too shy to call me. And so Colin set up airplane ticket and everything to come visit. So he visited and I picked him up at the airport. We went to a hotel like in the mountains area and it was the Indian head motel. And when we got there, uh, there was like a red hat society going on, which is, I didn't know what it was before, but it's a bunch of ladies in red hats who are like over 50. So the entire... The entire place was covered with red hat ladies. And Rod Stewart was playing a concert. But it ended up being a fake Rod Stewart, of course. <laughs> uh, we just had a hilarious time because everybody was old and we were dancing. You know, kind of cheesy. But So the next day we got a picture with him. And it happened to be the Wolf Holiday, which is the 13th, Friday, the, like when a 13th and the full moon happened on a Friday. <laughs> so it was the Wolf Holiday that he came and visited. And after that, um, he started visiting or staying months at a time with me. And he was still too shy to hit on me or anything. But eventually, obviously, that happened. <laughs> she used to drive around. New York in that down Larry side Manhattan or in Manhattan she's got a a, a Buick an old Buick um Riviera you know classic car and, and her mates bench seats all sit in it and go and play their music driving around New York and one of my songs is on their playlist and so when she saw I was in California she said hey how you doing you playing a concert or what and I said no I can't see you and we spent um I think three or four days in the mountains up in Vermont 
and went to a sort of retreat and it was like, you know, we, we were set and then on. He was very gentlemanlike, you know, he didn't make a move on me or anything like that. What I liked about him was we talked about books for the, I'm a librarian, we talked about books for the first two hours of meeting and that's very hard to find and he knew all the because i work in, in the library i can see all the new books like i don't read them all but he knew the titles of the new books and i was really impressed and i think it was just that it was mainly that the fact that he was from england i liked his accent naturally but that's when i got smitten i suppose <laughs> it's a very smart person the other day i was just joking, reading Thomas Paine, and he like knew the whole thing, and I was like, "Figures you'd know it." <laughs> so <laughs> I had room. I had um, landlords that were always gone, so I gave him. You know, he just wanted to get uh, out of Collins' house because there's always people there, so so he couldn't concentrate on writing or anything. And New Hampshire is kind of like idealistic for that. He could stay and have the whole first floor to himself and he started writing a lot after like a hiatus so he started writing a lot there this was 2015 that's when we met 2015 i think he went away for two months to london or two months back to england uh because of the visa thing and so yeah we actually we got a house together in peterborough new hampshire and it was a beautiful town um, and that's where Arthur happened. So he was just doting on because Arthur was coming. And then that's when I planned um, to go to England because I, I wanted to live in England. And we were going to plan on be moving to England. It's now 2016 and Wolf once again records with Julian. And the songs recorded, I'll step back from the brink. I used to know about it. And a bit later in 2017, all I ever wanted. Standing there in front of me Loving me like I've never been loved Loving me when I thought I'd be forsaken That must be love I can have my dog Calling out once more Answer me, answer me Pretty much straight after these recordings Natalie came over to the UK and visited Wolf's family and friends and she also took in some sights, but Brexit was now in full swing, and things were made very difficult, so Wolf would continue to travel back and forth to stay with Natalie. It went on like that for a couple of years, and here, and then three months there, three months here, and throughout the pregnancy, and I was there for Arthur's birth, the best day of my life, and yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to have Arthur in my life, so it's a miracle for me. Um... With all I've been through medically, uh, hospital time and the precarious things I put myself through, luckily I wasn't as uh, lost as some people get and uh, I was, I'm was i 100% healthy. So people say that's a miracle because people knew how lost I was on the or how badly I, need to, I needed to use it and how I used it was quite the most direct and most dangerous way of using it and it had it needed constant attention and that's why I survived. I took care of my habit. I took it seriously, you know. Um, uh, you know, in in contrast to what people might believe, you know, I, I was a drug addict and an alcoholic, but, and and an artist. Yeah, I'm two total, um, clean, sober, and for the first time, I, f- I, f- I feel good in my recovery because I, I work I work at, at, at my art every day. You know, my my writing. And, and and take care of my family 
and my aging father. So my days are full and I'm able to then have a look at what went wrong with my uh, fortunes. And uh, obviously I'm credited for a lot of Pete's music, but rather badly. And, and I've, I don't know how to put it, you know, I'm, I, yeah, I need to turn, I need to get paid for what I did you know, now, and I'm going to, that's it, I'm going to do what I can to do it because I need to see and look after my family. So simple as that. Yeah. I, I mean, it hurt at the time, but I had sort of put it behind me, but I'm resilient. It's not such an early recovery of people think I've been, I've been chipping away at that for quite a few years now. And I've got solid lumps of sobriety over the last two or three years and it hasn't shown me any, anything bad other than the mistakes I made when I was using they're hard to take and once you deal with them it, t- it turns around uh, you get to make things right for yourself which is only way ahead because then you can set about making things right with other people or with, with yourself I think the most important thing is, is to relish the challenge and uh, promise to myself it's a beautiful thing to see the sun come out you know in your circumstances when you when you stop doing all those things and you clear out the food and the drugs and all those hang-ups that go along with them it's very clear that jake fuel's anger spite and bitterness have certainly got the better of him over the years and it was in 2020 that jake asked for wolfman's name to be totally removed from the rough trades for lovers reissue but perhaps more astonishing is that wolf's name is replaced with his I did speak to Jake via email about this. I was warned very early on about just how touchy Jake was when it came to discussing anything to do with Peter Wolf, and the first email reply showed this to be very true. And he stated, Peter Wolf is not a great poet, but can be a great lyricist. I hold him directly responsible for the death of Robin Whitehead, and in fact he's been to prison for it, and in my opinion should have got a much longer sentence. This obviously influences any discussion of him as a person, and is the reason I deleted for lovers, and had his name removed from the title. I didn't ask someone to be put there instead, just for it to be removed. He sent the second email that said, For clarity, in 2010 after the death of Robin Whitehead, I deleted for lovers. More recently, Rough Trade, Beggars, wanted to re-release it, and I agreed on the condition that the name Wolfman was removed. They decided to put my name on it instead. I answered very politely. My apologies in advance, but I have to ask, did you not feel like you should correct them when they put your name on it? I sent the second email, just to clarify what I'm in. I'm just trying to ascertain exactly why, as I don't want to accuse anyone of any intention, if there was none. It wasn't long before Jake replied. It proves he had the name of someone that didn't appear on it at all, so not really. It's not like you get Bernie Taupin featuring Elton John. So I pushed a little further. Would it not be better for the side effects to be put on the front instead of you? This is when Jake's replies get quite confusing. He says, I thought he should have been beyond Bedlam Productions featuring Peter Dockey. There are plenty of producer records featuring a named singer, and this would most accurately be described as one of those. Rough Trade were responsible for putting my name on it, and I was responsible for taking the Wolfman name off it. I then replied to Jake and said, With all due respect, I'm not sure I agree with that, Jake. I think that could be argued in the case of a producer such as Phil Spector, but at the very least, this song was predominantly written by Peter Wolf and Julian Taylor, not you, or Peter Doherty, or any of the other people credited. If what you argue had any real merit, then someone such as George Martin would be credited all over the Beatles covers, and certainly as a co-writer. I then went on to add, I also think that if you had the weight to remove Wolfman from the cover, you certainly had the weight to remove yours too. I'm trying to convince myself that this was anything other than spite, but I'm finding that very difficult at the moment. Jake obviously got quite angry with this reply, and then sent me this last email. I have been very patient with you in your questions and have answered them truthfully. I could probably change it if I wanted to, but I let it lay where it fell. Do not reply to this email or approach me with any more questions. This was obviously my final contact with Jake. It's a sad fact that when making this documentary it became clear that some of the people closest to Wolf over the years seem to have possibly done the most damage to his career. It's always been widely believed that Wolf was very much his own enemy, and whilst that is true to a very large extent, the warnings and advice I was given when I reached out to Wolf for this film by some of his closest couldn't have been more wrong. Wolf himself has always been very open with me and extremely honest. He blames himself massively for his career, but in all the time I've known him and spoken to him, he clearly holds very little resentment. One thing that pains him more than anything else is that Andy Lee has a wealth of Wolf's work, 
songs, footage, lyrics, poetry, guitars, and some other personal possessions that he refuses to return to Wolf. It's not just footage that Andy has filmed or songs he has recorded at his home, but also a large amount of work Wolf did before even meeting Andy. There are some 50 odd songs that were entrusted into Andy's possession by Wolf because of the lifestyle Wolf lived at the time, and for the last five years, Andy has used just about every excuse under the sun not to return any of it. I did bring this up with Andy and got some quite puzzling excuses. I'm not holding it back from anybody. I've sent it to him before, in fact. He just always loses it. I don't know where the hell it is. I mean, probably around somewhere. Look, I can pretty much see something right here. But you know what it's like. It's on CD. So then you've got to find a CD drive. Peak full truck EP. I don't know what this got on it. Considering the time scale of this problem, he even had what I believed as hints of payment included. But Pete, Pete asking is probably, oh, can you get me my recordings? If you, oh, you've got my recordings, I'd love to have them. And then waiting. And nobody's doing anything. You know, he doesn't say, um, let's go out for lunch. I'll take you out for lunch. Could you bring those CDs with you? Or something like that. that that's not what happens. And, and you have to do that with people sometimes to get them to actually get it together. It is true. You know, if somebody said, you know, here's, you know, here's a thousand pounds, get together all of Pete Wolf's material. I would probably say to everyone else, you know what? I'm being paid for this. I'm going to go do it. So stand that I'm being kind of lazy about it. But also just just trying to finish my work. Um, I mean, I've I've supplied him and other people with copies of his work on multiple occasions in the past. Absolutely. Um, if you send me a list of what you do have, right, then I will look and see if I've got anything you don't have. The final reason I was given was the same as Wolf has been given for the past five years, and that was that Andy is far too busy to find and return any of it. Shortly after this last conversation, I was blocked from all of Andy's social media. I, I have Arthur, I have a body of work I'm working on, work I'm working hard at my art, and that's what, that's where I'm okay, and I've got something to, to work for now, and it's always my thing, if, if it goes okay in the future, things change, or the future's okay, the past takes on a different meaning, yeah, and I do want my work to get out now i'd like to be appreciated for what i do i'd be wonderful if that happened i'm not going to stake my life on it anymore i used to know about it I wrote, I wrote that about heroin and that lifestyle how i was away from it how everything revolved around heroin whatever came along it's, it's okay because you know i'm doing this but once you step out of that you actually have to engage with the real world and uh, it's about it's about that and it, it's a fairly simple lament for early days of, of heroin addiction which sort of has a tragic element to it because even when you start you very quickly know there's no happy ending but it's got you the line i like in that song is that if you really knew something you'd have to not let on in case it always lets you down and everything is wrong uh, i think that speaks about my beliefs and how they let me down and that's why I was hiding away I was scared to then sing my song for fear of it just all collapsing around me however much you people that love you and and believe you it's I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real true song for me yeah it's um I I used to know about it as a bit of a play on words I like, uh, used yeah because I think I'm, I've been in rehab quite a few times by then so everyone has the word used is around a lot um and it's you know published in brackets i uh, know about it so i'm saying i don't do heroin anymore and i don't i feel i feel glad to be alive glad i survived and really hopeful for the future because i have not enough that and i've still got music in me i was recording recently and i'm writing really well lately working hard and yeah so i'm set for the you know, foreseeable. That's why I'm. Uh, that's why I agreed to do this. Uh, the past needs uh, take on a different meaning for me. Uh, the best music I, that my the real sound I wanted I wanted to produce all of this time. I, I have a collection of works, the works of Peter Wolf, which will be released soon. There's a short pamphlet edition of poetry coming out real tune now uh, yeah the collective works being compiled which will be on sale i think 2024 
and some real good uh, music to come when uh, things are a little more settled for me this year. Yeah. <laughs> Um, excellent. Wicked. 